I, I was really troubled this week by information that came to me with regard to what's going on. I do not want to make a political statement. Please, please don't misunderstand. But if anybody here gets COVID, whatever you do, do not go into a hospital. I did not understand from, from about February of 2020, there was a, a mandate given from the National Institute of Health directed by Dr. Fauci that everyone that goes into the hospital with COVID to be treated must be given a five-day treatment of remdesivir. Are you aware of this? Remdesivir, you've heard of it. So that's what the hospitals must do. To this day, they're still doing this. So it turns out that a doctor began to do research on remdesivir. Remdesivir was developed for Ebola. Okay, 2018, tests were done on remdesivir. 8% of the people doing the test died from kidney failure caused by the remdesivir, and they had to suspend the test because it was killing too many people. It was only a test of 50-some people, but from three countries. Remdesivir was never given FDA approval. It is still under emergency use authorization. But think about this now. If you get COVID and you go and you submit yourself to a hospital, they will put you under five days of treatment with remdesivir. And for at least 8% of the people who go through this, they will experience chronic kidney failure, which chronic kidney failure causes you to start, your kidney can't process your bodily liquids anymore, and it starts building up in your abdomen, and then it starts filling up into your lungs. Hence the need for ventilators and oxygen because the person is drowning in their own fluids. This has been known all along. I, I'm not here to make a political statement. I'm simply saying if you get COVID, please do not put yourself into a hospital. I asked one of our members who's an RN to look into some of this information just in the last 24 hours. She did so and she confirmed it's all true. Okay? This is really serious. Our government has not been honest with us about this whole thing. And I'm not denying that, that COVID is real, not denying it for a moment, but then influenza could do the same thing. And by the way, now we find out that the test that they used to tell us if it was COVID or not is not accurate and couldn't determine between COVID or influenza. But the truth of the matter is, if a person you love or know of, I'm saying this here because here we're, let's say, 80 people. That means we have contacts with 800 or 8,000 people because you have people you know. My neighbor walked across the street yesterday terribly distraught because his wife is on a ventilator right now. And he said, Pastor, he says, can you have your church pray because she's suffering chronic kidney failure? This is what's happening, okay? And no matter what you feel about the vaccine, I'm not even addressing that at this point. I'm just saying, if you get COVID, do not submit yourself to a hospital because even if you have the best hospital and the best doctor in the world, they must follow the protocol that they've been told to follow, which is put you on a drug that does not even have FDA approval. It is an experimental drug known to kill people. So, may God help us. That does it. We're going to pray. <laughs> All right. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, Father, that we come to you, the sovereign Lord of the universe, Almighty God. Heavenly Father, in a time of great turmoil and confusion, we come to you because we know that there is one who is rock solid, and that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we come to you, Father, with great thanksgiving. Dear Lord, we pray that you would so fill your church and your people with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the message of salvation that, Lord, we would not be able to keep silent, especially in a world so confused and so desperately in need. Father, use us to testify of the Lord Jesus Christ while we still have that opportunity. Thank you, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So how does a little church like Sierra Baptist Church, how, how, how do we survive? I mean, what would happen if, 
if something dire happened to our little church, is there some bigger organization that Sierra Baptist Church is a part of that if uh, something came up and we went through some hardships or some problem, that the bigger organization would say, oh, don't worry, little brother, we got you. Short answer, no. As far as an earthly organization, no, we're an independent Baptist church. We believe that's what God's Word teaches. In other words, there's two things that keep this, that gives the energy, the drive, the momentum for this church. One is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the other is the collective goodwill of God's people who, who recognize that here in this community, we need one another and we need the, the, the testimony of a church that preaches the truth of salvation in Jesus Christ. Not only do we need that testimony, our community needs that testimony and it's important. And so we, we value what goes on in this church. But it turns out that for every positive energy that, that works to keep a church afloat and moving ahead, there's always some, some negative momentum. There's always the enemy of our soul that's working against. I'd like to use a, a secular illustration to maybe help us understand. It's that of an airplane. How does an airplane work? I mean, you ever see an airplane sitting out at an airport and it's just sitting there? It's not flying. Well, what makes it fly? Well, there's some physical forces involved. It turns out that for an airplane to fly, it has to generate lift, and the lift has to be greater than the weight. Can you imagine a little model airplane this big picking up uh, 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 you know, 300 passengers and carrying them? Of course not. So the physics, there's physics involved that you have to have sufficient lift, big enough lifting airfoil like a wing. So there has to be enough lift to overcome weight. But wait a minute, when the airplane's sitting out there at the airport, it's not lifting anything. It's just sitting there. It can't even lift its own weight. No, that's because it has to have thrust. It has to have forward motion through the air, and as the wind goes over the air, it creates a low pressure area on top of the wing, and that low pressure area on top of the wing is supported by the air under it, and it creates lift. So if you don't have thrust moving forward through the air, you're not going to have lift. But it turns out that in addition to thrust, there's another force called drag. <laughs> drag is everything that's hanging out there in the wind is trying to slow you down. So it turns out that in an airplane, if, if thrust and lift are not greater than drag and weight, you're going down. Or at least you're not going up. And the same thing is true in a church. In not just this church, every church, there are forces at work, and if lift and thrust are not greater than weight and drag, mm, not going in a good direction. So it's important for us to consider and say, well, okay, well, that's just us. No, this is the, this is the case all over. This is the, the, the constant challenge that churches have. Are we... Do we have enough thrust and lift? And of course, we know that there are churches that come up with all kinds of ways to try and overcome this. But sometimes we, we carelessly resort to this verse in Matthew 16, 18, because Jesus said it, so it's got to be good. And he said, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Therefore, our church will never fail. It's not what he was saying. It turns out that Hades in their day, was the word for where people went when they died. And the gates of Hades didn't mean Satan's kingdom. The gates of Hades meant death. That was a phrase, a figurative phrase for dying. You know, the gates were, you know, you're going to Hades, and so you're at the gate. So we would say someone's at death's door. Same kind of an expression. So when Jesus said, I will build my church, and even my death on the cross will not keep me from building my church, that's what he was saying. He's not saying there that because you once started a church, therefore your church is guaranteed to last forever. That's just crazy. That's a total misunderstanding of what Jesus was saying. And, and we know that's not true because down through the history of the church, many churches have come and gone, right? In fact, in Revelation chapter 2, when Jesus... Uh, spoke to John to record messages to the churches, to the church in Ephesus, by the way, the church that we're discussing in Acts chapter 20, to the messenger, that's really what the word angel means, to the messenger of the church of Ephesus, really it's intended to be for the pastor of the church, the one who is the messenger, to the messenger of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, he already said that the seven stars are the messengers of the churches. 
He holds him in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Each lampstand was typical of a church, emblematic of a church. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. You know, the, this pastor of the Ephesus church, this guy, he was a fundamentalist. He was, he, we would gladly have him as the president of our association. Huh. Nevertheless, uh-oh. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. In other words, in other words, the, the, the heart of the, of the minister leading that church could lead to the eventual closing of a church. Jesus is saying, I will come and remove your lampstand if you don't get with it. Wow. That's kind of surprising. That's kind of shocking. But that leads us directly to our theme for this morning. You see, we have an enemy, and he's a very real enemy, and his desire is to shut down the church of Jesus Christ in general and every specific church. Now, let me rephrase that just a bit. I'm not sure about every church. There, there may be another church, uh, maybe one, if you cross King Road, just on the other side of the freeway, that Satan really wouldn't bother him a bit if that church went on forever. There are churches that don't preach the truth of salvation in Jesus Christ at all. They just, they just preach a lot of feel good about yourself and uh, be a nice person. And, uh, and there are churches that they don't follow the actual instructions of what God's Word says a church should be. They're doing something. It's still a building. It, it might still have a cross on it. I don't know. That doesn't make it a church. And it doesn't make so those kinds of churches are not even a target for Satan, are they? But churches that are preaching the truth, mm hmm, that's another matter. So let's work together to preserve our church. I don't know that I'm going to do a really good job of helping to preserve Bethany Baptist Church in Salem, Oregon. I don't live in Salem, Oregon. I live here. In other words, there's nothing wrong with us becoming actively involved in preserving and looking for the well-being of our church. In fact, I think that's what God wants us to do. Paul, he can't stop for too long in Ephesus. He's on his way to, the, to, to, to Jerusalem. And, but as he stops, he calls the elders of the church, just the elders to come out and meet him. And he has a message for them, kind of a little mini retreat. And he's challenging them about the fact, guys, this is a real battle, and there's a real enemy trying to destroy your church, the church in Ephesus. And I have a challenge for you. And so he, he points out five what I'll call destroyers. Could have looked at them from a positive standpoint. I looked at them from a negative, just to be negative for a change. And um, let's work together to preserve our church, defending against five destroyers, church destroyers. And the first one I'll call gospel shame. It's a church destroyer. Say, so what does that mean? Well, Paul says, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. What does he mean by that? Well, he says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. In other words, Paul considered it a moral obligation to communicate to people in his day about salvation in Jesus Christ. And that if he didn't, he'd be guilty before God, because people need to know about salvation in Jesus Christ. I know this sounds corny, but what I said earlier about the whole the thing about not going to the hospital, I wrestled about, God, what should I do? Should I, should I mention this in church? But when my neighbor yesterday came and his wife's already been in, on the ventilator for several days, and I'm going, the problem is, is people are not being told the truth. And it's literally killing them. It's not right. And, and I stood with my neighbor right in front of our house, cars driving by, and I put my hand on his shoulder and I prayed with him right there. And, you know, he doesn't know the Lord. His wife, I believe, does. I, I'm not sure. I shouldn't say about Ron. But, but 
It's just not right what's going on. And by the same token, it's not right that people around us should not know the truth of salvation in Jesus Christ, especially now. Our Savior's return, everything in the Bible and prophecy gives us indication our Savior's return could be very soon. And therefore, we have a a moral responsibility to be telling people about Jesus Christ. Paul says, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I have not kept anything back. Say, well, why would he? I mean, he was, an, he was an apostle. Why would he keep anything back? Why would he be ashamed of the gospel? That doesn't make any sense. Well, I can think of a few reasons why the apostle Paul might have kept quiet. Seems to me that on one of his missionary journeys, they stoned him. I mean, they stoned him with physical stones. <laughs> they intended to kill him. They left him as if he was dead. I guess that would be unconscious. Uh, that would kind of be a maybe a negative incentive. You know, you, 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 I don't know how many times you would have to be stoned before you say, I'm not think, I don't think I want to do the gospel thing anymore. Uh, it hurt. It was painful. Well, we, I've never experienced anything like that. I don't think any of us here have ever experienced that. But, but sadly, if we think about it, gospel shame is a destroyer of the church. When God's people... When we become more interested in anything else, whether in the church or out of the church, individually we have all kinds of interests, right? We like this or we like that. I like doing this. I like doing that. If those things become more important than our mission of telling people about Jesus Christ, then suddenly weight is getting heavier than lift and suddenly drag is getting stronger than thrust. You say, well, why? Well, I don't know, maybe it's just California, but really good people seem to leave this place. If you think about our church and you think about Elaine leaving our church, you can't blame her. And don't any of the rest of you think you can get away with leaving. Uh, There's something about California, you know, people tend to leave. And uh, I can understand that. It, and, and not only that, since, since in the 12 years that Joan and I have been in this church, uh, there have been several significant families, entirely families, pack their bags and move out, right? Not only that, we've had other people who've simply said, Pastor, I've had enough. I'm going to heaven. We've had a whole series that have packed their bags and gone straight to heaven. <laughs> they didn't pack anything. <laughs> But boy, they, I, and I, don't, I don't blame them a bit. And then there's some others who are struggling with, with issues of age. Wally called me this week and says, Pastor, I just want everybody to know I really miss everybody and I want to be back. He's dealing with some issues, infection on his leg or something. And he said, I really miss everybody. And so, you know, we, we have that. All that to say, if we're not reaching new people with the gospel of Christ, then drag is overcoming thrust and weight is overcoming lift. Right? So, so gospel shame, how could it possibly be that we who know Jesus Christ should not be absolutely filled with joy? And by the way, there are things we can do at church that will distract us from the telling of the gospel, aren't there? We could become involved in uh, feeding the hungry. It's a good thing to do. But if feeding the hungry becomes a more important goal than people putting their faith in Jesus Christ, then it becomes drag and not lift or not thrust. Gospel shame would be a sad thing. Paul, he says, I I kept back nothing that was helpful. I proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, I'm afraid that there are churches that, that... have really awesome worship teams and worship band and and worship music and everything is cool and awesome. Well, Paul never even mentioned the worship team. I I, I almost get the impression he didn't have one. I, I just I mean we can't conceive of church without a worship team and, and a band and and no he says what matters is repentance toward God. That has to do with a recognition of our sinfulness and, and a change of heart, a change of mind, and, and a change of direction. Repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter, in the day of Pentecost, 
He said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that you really need to have more worship going on and you got to feel good about yourself. No, that's not what he said. He said, you need to know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And he said, oh, no, I didn't mean to make you feel bad. I, forgive me, my, my satire, but wow, so much of what's done in the name of church today doesn't look anything like what happened in the first century. Peter preached in such a way that they were cut to the heart. They were convicted of sin. He didn't make them feel good about themselves. I think he made them feel badly about themselves. And they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, everyone, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. Change of heart, change of mind. Oh, wow, that's just so different than what happens in so many places. I, I, I often like to say that you shouldn't judge a church so much by what gets preached, but by what doesn't get preached. And oftentimes what gets left out is any, any mention of the fact that we're sinners and that we need to be forgiven. But we have a Savior who did everything to forgive us. And when we put our trust in Him, He's more than willing to forgive. Gospel shame. What did Paul say in Romans chapter 1, verse 16? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What was the song we just sang? Go tell the how's that going? Was it? That I'm a Christian. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. And I, I wonder. Can we, do we expect that God will somehow just grab people out of thin air and force them to come into our church? Or has he not called us to be his witnesses and to share that message of salvation? And, and, and by the way, it's not about saying, oh man, we got the greatest band or we got the greatest preacher. Or No, it's about a message of salvation in Jesus Christ. Let's not be ashamed of the gospel. Let's not be ashamed of the message that it's not, I mean, look, we don't even tell people when you come to our church, you have to get down on your knees and, and do hands and knees all the way up to the altar. Don't say anything like that. Just, the message of the gospel has to do with recognizing our, our sin before a holy and righteous God and realizing that Jesus died to pay for it. Wow, it's not even complicated. Gospel shame. That is, that is a destroyer of the church, of the local church. When we as God's people become ashamed of the gospel, oh man, that's not good. That's, we're headed in the wrong direction. We need, to, we need to be confident that God does. And by the way, just because we share the gospel doesn't mean everybody's going to like it. Some people we share the gospel and they're not going to like it. It's all right. We still share with them in the love of Christ and pray that God will use us. Second destroyer is what I would call personal decay, based on what Paul said. Paul said, therefore, take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. We'll talk about that in a moment. Take heed to yourselves. This has to do with our own walk with God. And, and I believe that one of the great destroyers of the local church is personal decay. Each one of us needs to recognize before God, you know what? I need to have a life. I need to have a life that's on fire for God. Remember what I said. Paul here is giving this instructions. He's giving these instructions to the leaders of the church in Ephesus. This is around 57, 57 AD, more or less. We're talking 92 or 93 AD, 65 years or 35 years later. 35. Uh, 65. No, 35 years later. I'll get it right. I can do math, just not while I'm standing up in front. 35 years later. Here's the Apostle John writing to the church in Ephesus to the leader of the church. He says, Orthodox man, you're on it. You're doing everything right. You Theologically, you get an A+. Plus. But what happened to your first love? Isn't that what he said? I think that's what he said. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. See, it's not enough 
just to be a, a seminary professor and, 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 and know all this stuff. That's why Paul said, take heed to yourselves. It isn't just about getting an A in theology class and being able to teach and, and all that stuff, knowing how to study in Greek. No, it's about it's about a walk with God. And if my life goes flat in my relationship with Jesus Christ, the whole church suffers. Right? The same is true for each of you. The challenge is to every one of us. Thank, thank you, Lord. It's not just me, but it's all of us. Personal decay. If, if you've come to a point in your Christian walk where you have plateaued, then you're going down. Then you're, then you're at a point where weight is starting to overcome lift and, and drag is starting to overcome thrust. Personal decay is a church destroyer. When, when, when we come to church, we interact with one another. Uh, this is like herd immunity. <laughs> you know, herd immunity. We, we interact with each other, don't we? We affect one another. And so when we, when we get to a point where spiritually we're dried up and we come, we have nothing to give. Now we can still come and be encouraged by others, but may God help us, every one of us, to say, hey, I have a role to play in my local church, but it starts with my own walk with God. May God help us to never get bored with the Christian walk. I, I spent far too many years of my life, and I learned from far too many people what it looks like to have a flat, boring, apathetic, dead Christian life. It's all too possible. Let's not ever neglect our walk with God. May God just set us on fire for Jesus Christ. Second, or the second part of this decay part is the corporate decay. Paul says to them, Therefore, take heed to yourselves, yes, and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now he's addressing the leaders here and saying that they have a responsibility to pay attention to the whole flock. Um, this is challenging. To pay attention to the, to the spiritual climate of the whole flock? I mean, I don't know how a church of uh, even 300, how the, uh, the leadership can stay on top of paying attention to the spiritual needs of a whole church. In a small church, it's almost doable. But even then, we go in every different direction. Some of you I only see once a week for an hour, right? So how are we going to manage taking heed to the whole flock to make sure that we're not gone flat, spiritually speaking. This is challenging at the very least. And, and I covet your prayers, but, but we need to be praying for one another and concerned for one another and looking out for one another. And when we see that a person is, is spiritually struggling to be able to come alongside and say, hey, why don't you come join us in our Bible study or whatever it is that, that God may use, but we need to be concerned for one another because corporate decay is a church destroyer. And let's not be naive. There are churches all over that get involved in this activity or that, but there's a spiritual corporate decay that will end up destroying the church. And the enemy wants nothing more than to do that. In Ephesians chapter 4, this is a long passage, but it's worth reading. We have this description of the ministry of those who are in spiritual leadership in a church. He himself, speaking of Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. That's the purpose of those in spiritual leadership. Until we all come to a unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, there's, there's, there's a fair amount in here to learn. And it, you know, we don't do that in a week or two. There's a lot to learn. And that's one of the challenges and responsibilities of those in spiritual leadership. And uh, so when we look for a, a future pastor of a church, future leader, we want to see that they have some modicum of Scripture knowledge and understanding that they've studied, that they understand something. And so, because they're in the position of teaching these things. So they're to bring along the whole flock to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Because we know that there are cults and groups all over teaching all kinds of crazy stuff. But speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ, 
from whom the whole body, he's talking about the church now, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the building of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened. You know, I, I look around at what's going on right now in our nation and all the, the crazy things going on, and I'm going, I don't understand why there's so much blindness. And then when I stop and think about it, I say, no, wait a minute, I do understand. Satan loves to deceive people. And in the past, in America, I believe that there was enough of an influence of the gospel of Jesus Christ and of godly people in all different positions and authority that we expected more of the truth. We're come to a point now where people spit out lies on a routine basis, and it's just like even the people claim to be fact checkers are about as far from the truth as they could possibly be. Well, we shouldn't be surprised. That's what's in the world. That's what Satan does. He's a deceiver. They're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. By the way, while we have devices where we can answer any question by saying, Google, we have all this information, but the information doesn't do us any good if we don't have a heart open to Almighty God who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which is created according to God and true righteousness and holiness. Can you imagine that we get to renew, have a renewed mind Wow, and that's what, that's what being in church is all about. Now, I, I, don't get me wrong, I like uh, worship music. Some of the contemporary worship music I like. And some of it I find very uplifting, and some of it can, can, can make me have a, a, a moment of, of emotion and, and so forth. But in general, most of the, of the worship music does not bring me to one of those aha moments. But this book does. This book is God's Word. This is where we learn what's right and what God desires of us. And, and, and this book is, is it, it's, it's living and powerful and it teaches us. And, and Paul, he seems to talk a lot more about this than he does about some of the other things that we do in churches. Let's work together. We all contribute to preserve our church. Defending against five destroyers. First, gospel shame. That's a destroyer. Personal decay. That's a destroyer. Corporate decay. If we do not corporately demand the truth of God's word and insist on that, it will destroy us. We may get big in numbers. That could happen. But it will destroy us. Hebrews 11, 13, 17 says, Obey those who rule over you. Literally, those who lead. Rule over not the greatest translation there. Obey those who lead you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. No wonder there are so few volunteers for uh, ministry today. It's, it's a high calling. It's uh, a big responsibility. We should, we should work together with those that God has put in spiritual leadership, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Corporate decay is a church destroyer. Fourthly, satanic tools. Let's work together to preserve our church, defending against these destroyers, gospel shame, personal decay, corporate decay. Fourthly, satanic tools. Satanic tools? Paul says, I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. I think commentators are pretty much in agreement that he's not talking about literal wolves. He's talking about false teachers who will come in like a wolf would come in and attack a flock of sheep. And he's trying to help them understand that when you're involved in the leadership of a local church, there will be those attacks that come from the enemy of our souls 
And there's a whole, Satan has a, he has a whole catalog. He's a Rolodex file, or he's got it on his phone, I don't know, of all kinds of ways to attack and tear down and destroy a local church. And so he literally has tools that he can and does and will use. And he's had a couple thousand years experience. He knows what works. And so he's in the business of sending his emissaries, sending in wolves. And it's kind of interesting because any of us, we live at a snapshot point in history. We don't always have all the video to see what happened before and what led up to this and why we are where we are. And so in many cases, we may feel really good about some personality, some religious personality that's a, a dynamic uh, Bible communicator. And, and uh, sadly, I can think of a whole series of names right now who were much respected and looked up to in the Christian world as being a great dynamic leader or church leader. And all of a sudden, kaboom, they come crashing down and did a tremendous amount of church destruction in the process. I don't know what to say about them. But did they never know the Lord at all? Were they just playing a satanic tool to start with? When they go to the point, as some have done, being nationally known, and then turning around to the point of saying, I'm not a Christian. Say, what? I no longer believe what the Bible teaches about morality, for example. I no longer believe one man, one woman for life, or whatever it is. And I look at that and I say, what? They just said, I'm no longer a Christian, and they were a prominent leader? Well, I, I guess I would have to say that was a satanic tool. That was a plant. And yet, sadly, we as Christians have to be very careful because we can be deceived. And that's why Paul is saying, guys, pay attention here. Watch out, because like a wolf coming into a... Does the wolf say, I'm over here and I'm coming down to attack now. I'm going to come try to... No. He comes in unexpected and kaboom. He does his damage. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says, The Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. See, how is this possible? Well, certainly that's an overstatement. Certainly that's hyperbole, Pastor. He didn't really mean that. No, as a matter of fact, he did mean that. And we have a living example right up the road in Redding, California, at a place called Bethel Church. I, I, I don't like calling that out, but sadly when you have a pastor who starts out as if he's preaching the truth of salvation, and the next thing you know, he's bringing in associates who literally are doing demonic activity and communicating a familiar spirit, and the kid starts going crazy and thrashing around on the floor under a demonic influence. And the guy's wife goes out and lays on graves to soak up the karma or something. The pastor's wife. So can I go then to that church and, and oh, take in their worship service because it's really cool? Uh, I think what Paul said to Timothy here is happening right now in our day. And, and, and I believe that Paul was warning clear back in his day. We, there are, Satan is a master at sending his tools to destroy the church. And many times the destruction doesn't come until everybody's become comfortable and relaxed with whatever wolf it is. And then all of a sudden the fangs, the teeth come out and the destruction is done and it's too late to undo it. I mean, again, uh, you know, I listen to some of the music that comes from the church down there in Australia. We, do, we even use some of it here in our church. And then they plant churches all over the world and they plant a church in New York City and then Turns out that the, the, the lead pastor of their church, officially sanctioned and ordained, is involved in moral perversity that can't even be described. And you just look at it and think, what a, what, a, what a sad, sad, sad commentary. The truth of the matter is, Satan is in the business of planting his emissaries because he wants to destroy. And here's what's sad. So in a church like that, you have young people that come from a church like this. 
that preaches and teaches the Word of God, but oh, the worship is so cool over at Hillsong. So they go to Hillsong and they get all, oh, yeah, yeah. And then, bam, the pastor falls into horrible immorality and those, those young people are sucked out of good Bible preaching churches where they came from and they lose all heart. And Satan has done his damage. So uh, we, we, we don't have a big worship band. But we have what Paul had. The truth of salvation in Jesus Christ. And I I think this is more important. No, I know it is. Let's work together to preserve our church, defending against five church destroyers. Gospel shame, being ashamed of the gospel. Personal decay, corporate decay, satanic tools, because he's a master. And finally, (laughs) self-seekers. I start a new club called the self-seekers. Oh no, that's not right. Self-seekers. Paul said, also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Self-seekers. These will be people from amongst you. Those who, who we expected to be spiritual leaders in the church. Self-seekers. To draw away disciples after themselves. It turns out that in times of ease in a church, in times of prosperity in a church, like what we have in America right now, um, being in the church business can be a pretty good deal. You can, you, if you work it right and if you've got a little charm, you can, you can make money. Sadly, there are many people who have learned this. Do you know that there are numerous musical groups, contemporary Christian groups, who've discovered that they, before they were a contemporary Christian group, they were just in the world and they weren't doing so well. They didn't have very much success. And they jumped into Christian music and go, whoa, this is good. We're making money. We can sell. This is not a new problem. I have a book by A.J. Gordon written 150 years ago. He talked about it 150 years ago. Churches that, oh, the church is big and we want to have really, really good music. So we're going to pay a you know, an opera singer to come in and sing, and they're not even born again. This is not a new situation. And that's why some of those very people end up, after several years of being in churches and leading worship, they end up walking away from the faith because they never were believers to start with. Or in this case, the self-seekers are the ones who, maybe they started out with the best of intentions, but they soon found out, man, I can make a pretty good, I got a pretty good gig going here. And they start thinking of how this is going to benefit them personally. They start looking after their own self-interests. Brethren, all of us need to be concerned about this church destroyer. This is the church destroyer that brings arguments at business meetings. When I start looking after my interests, me, what I want, me, instead of saying, you know what, maybe what I want right now is not all that important. I want to see God's work go forward. I want to see God do powerful things in this church. Self-seekers destroy. That's not the way God intends it to be. 2 Timothy 4, Paul writes, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort. Say all kinds of nice things to people. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. If it ain't in a video, they won't. Oh, by the way, even the videos don't work. It's really, it's really comical because um, on Awana, Awana night, you know, we, we, we try and reach out to the junior high age kids and, and uh, Brother Jim does a Bible study with them and, and Brother Barry, you know, we try and get some video things to work with him. And, and a lot of times these young people, you know, in my day, it was like, oh, cool, we're going to have, remember in school, oh, the, the teacher's got the 16 millimeter projector out. Yes, right? <laughs> well, now it's like, it's like they put on a video and when they, 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 the video's there and they put up, they got their little iPhone thing, you know, and they're looking at it. They don't even care, right? I guess holographic images. I don't know. What do you do next? Uh, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. 
But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Preach the word, he says. Preach the word. Yeah, but pastor, it's really out of style. Nobody likes it. So, okay, okay, just rip that page out of your Bible. Right? No. If, 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 if God tells us that we're to preach the word, then we're to preach the word. Will everybody automatically like it? No. But then listen. Have you noticed this? We have a lot of influence on one another. When, when Joan and I went to Brazil when we were young, and our youngest was six months old, and our oldest was eight years old, and we get to Brazil, it's the Amazon. I mean, we're near the mouth of the Amazon River. By the way, the mouth is really big. Somebody says, let's go look at the mouth of the Amazon River. You're going to have to be able to see a couple hundred miles wide. It's big. Um, in any case, so we get there, and uh, it wasn't fun. There was nothing really fun about being there. And our eight-year-old daughter, Anna, she got mosquito bites like you cannot imagine. She was like magnetic. I mean, we, in the first week, she must have had like 100 mosquito bites on her or more. And uh, she just had these little welts all over, you know. It wasn't fun. And Joan is a mother with a six-month-old baby. Do you think it's fun for a six-month-old a mother with a six-month-old baby? Do you think it's fun for her to see your, your eight-year-old like that? And she's got a six-year-old, and then she's got a three-year-old, and she's got a six-month-old. It's not, it's not a whole lot of fun. So, so what are we going to do? Lord, you got to help us to set the pace for our children. Because, and and you got to help dad to set the pace for mom because she could be discouraged in these circumstances, couldn't she? Do you know something? Every one of us, when we come to church, we have an impact on one another. And if we come to church with a, a long face and I'm here, but I wish I was out on the lake or I wish I was doing this or I wish I was doing that and oh my goodness, the pastor's going over again and oh, got too many Bible verses in there. Listen, our attitude contributes either to lift and thrust or drag and weight. And it has to do with each one of us. This church, our Savior has done everything necessary for this church to be here and do well. Now it's up to us. What do we want for this church? What do we want for the future of this church? And, and you know, yeah, we could, we could try some, uh, you know, the gospel blimp. Some of you remember that old movie, you know. We could have a, you know, a blimp ride after church service to get more people to come. Yeah. You know, that's lift. It's just artificial lift. And if we use gimmicks or techniques or devices to try and boost the effect of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're taking the church in the wrong direction. Sadly, that's what's happening in so many places is we're going to use a technique, a device, some other thing to boost. We don't need that. We need thrust and lift. And that comes from each of us being committed to the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and getting our own heart set on fire for Jesus Christ. There's something that Satan cannot deal with, and that's when a Christian gets his heart set on fire for Jesus Christ. I, I, sadly, it took me many years before I discovered that there was such a thing as a Christian life. Oh, I was, I was saved when I was five and baptized when I was seven and was in church every Sunday from the time I was two weeks old. So I, I, I knew all about being in church. But it took me many years before I discovered that there's far more to this Christian life than I had any idea. This life is rich and alive. There's a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and God desires to work through us. Let's work together to preserve our church. Oh my goodness, it's noon. It's time to stop. Got a lunch right down the hall.
Defending against five destroyers, gospel shame. That's a destroyer. That's a church destroyer. Personal decay, corporate decay, satanic tools, self-seekers. All of these are destroyers of the local church. May God help us to find great joy and satisfaction in supporting the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this good day. Thank you for every person that's here. Thank you, Father, for your forgiveness. Thank you for such a Savior. We come into your presence because of the precious shed blood of our dear Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray that for every one of us who are here today, who knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray, Father, that you would ignite a fire under us, open our hearts to realize that the Christian life is so much more. Teach us what it means to be filled with your Spirit. Lord, it, we, we, there, there, there's... I, I know that you expect so much more when we read the book of Acts and see how these people were on fire for Christ. Give us the faith of a Stephen. Father, give us the, the, the joy of a Philip of going out and sharing the gospel and seeing people put their faith in Christ. And thank you, Father, for the privilege. Now unto him who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.